Good morning, my friends, and thank you for joining me for this morning's devotion. My name is John Phipps, the lead pastor of Park Place Church. It's my honor and privilege to share with you this morning. Um, you know, we just had a wonderful service yesterday. Yesterday was um, Communion Sunday. It was great. Good to see you guys this morning, Dina and Michael. <clears throat> um, a lot of people were watching from home or were traveling. Obviously, this is a holiday week. So I want to say happy Thanksgiving to you guys. But the best part of the service yesterday was we shared communion. And that was really a wonderful time for us to be together. Uh, and then I had a wonderful birthday party. Um, so it's good to see you, Deanna. I see you there and I saw you at the birthday party. And we got to celebrate Mikey and Gabe as they turned five years old. Good morning, Hillary and Lynn and Terry and Diana and Larry. Thank you for joining us and Pam. Um, and then I went to a birthday party again last night, which was a lot of fun. Good morning, Dale and Julie and Jan. Hope you're doing well, my friend. So God is doing wonderful things, but I had a very full weekend. Don't forget this weekend, um, we did the 24 hour prayer and fasting. Now, the reason why I'm asking you not to forget that is because the people that we prayed for still need prayer. Amen. We prayed for a lot of people, a lot of people, many of which we didn't know, but they are your family members or your friends or your coworkers, things like this. We had a lot of prayer requests. And so as we came together for 24 hours of prayer and fasting, it's not over my friends. Just because the event is over, the 24-hour prayer and fasting is over, doesn't mean we shouldn't still pray. We need to continue praying for those people um, each and every day. And so please be mindful of that and the people that you've committed to pray for, uh, for that event, that you will continue as um, the Lord brings them to your mind. Uh, if you're anything like me, your prayer times are a little bit sporadic. Let me tell you about my prayer time. I don't always go into my prayer time with an agenda, uh, pen and paper, notepad, that kind of thing. Uh, if you do, that's great. I think it's fantastic if you do. Um, I, I do my prayer time where I'm just not worried about how long I'm going to be in prayer. Uh, so I don't have an alarm that gets, that goes off after five minutes or 15 minutes. Good morning, Bernadette. Good to see you, my friend. Good morning, Donna. Um, but you know, when I get in my place of prayer, I just ask the Lord to bring people to my mind, to my heart that need prayer. I ask the Lord to help me to think about and to reveal things to me about how I can pray for others. And he does. Sometimes he reminds me of things that you said, um, you know, um, difficulties that you're going through that you've shared with me and, it, and, and the Holy Spirit um, brings this to my mind, and then I get a chance to uh, lift you up before the Lord. Sometimes it's people I haven't seen in a while. Sometimes it's people that I haven't seen in years um, that may not even live in this state. And that's all okay. Sometimes we need to come before the Lord in a, a posture of prayer um, that is just very open-ended, open-minded. Okay? Open-ended and open-minded. It's just, I'm going to pray as long as I need to. I'm going to pray for whoever the Lord puts on my heart at this moment. And I'm going to, um, I'm just going to just be completely obedient to what God has me to pray about. So anyway, that's my two cents on prayer. But I want to thank you guys for joining us for our 24-hour prayer and fasting. And then we had a brown bag event, brown bag ministry Saturday. That was great. That was a lot of fun. And I want to thank you guys for uh, taking part in that. We got to feed some people and, and fellowship together. That was awesome. Today I'm talking about a controversial topic, okay? I'm still doing Bible studies in which they are contextual, and we're working through verse by verse sometimes, and sometimes it's more topical. Today is very topical. Uh, if you saw my Facebook post this morning, I mentioned that we would be talking about prosperity preaching, and the perils of prosperity preaching. Now, I talk about this a little bit from the pulpit, not a lot. I've never preached a sermon on this. I'll never preach a sermon against the, um, the perils of prosperity preaching. But it's important for you to understand, I'll teach on just about anything. And I posted a video on my Facebook page this morning 
which will turn your stomach, and it turned mine. Um, it's not necessarily a dig at any particular pastor. Uh, my job is not to judge pastors. That's God's job. My job is to um, to de to um, not reconstruct philosophies of ministries, but to deconstruct so that we can reconstruct. What I'm saying is, is that when there are heretics and, and fallacies in the church, um, that makes me very sad. Um, what I want to do is um, I, I want to break apart those, those, um, those heresies. A heresy is a false teaching, okay? A heretic is a false teacher. And um, I'm not trying to call anybody out this morning, though I did actually kind of do that this morning. If you look at my Facebook page, it is a video of a prosperity preacher. Don't go right now. You can do it later. But my point is, is that um, usually when in my teaching and preaching, um, I don't feel it's important to call out preachers. I'll let God do that. I don't think it's my place to call out denominations necessarily. Um, I'll let God do that and judge them. But when it comes to topics that are um, heresies, such as prosperity preaching or prosperity gospel, um, I will call that out. I will call that out. We all know who they are. Um, some of the most popular preachers are preaching prosperity. Why? Because it's a very popular uh, philosophy. Why wouldn't it be? Um, so I found this article by John Piper, and you guys know John Piper, perhaps. He's the founder and teacher of Desiring God. Uh, I believe it's the book called Desiring God, but uh, he calls his ministry Desiring God. And prosperity preaching over the years has gotten very popular. Good morning, Mike. Good to see you, brother. Um, and it's deceitful and it's deadly. Prosperity preaching is deceitful and it's deadly. And I'm going to be spending a few minutes talking about this particular article that I read and some of the high points that he makes. And he also gives us some scripture references. So if you have your handy dandy Bible, uh, keep it open. If not, I'll be reading some scriptures to you. Um, but luring people to Christ to get rich is both deceitful and deadly. I'm going to say that to you again, and I need you to understand that luring people to Christ because of prosperity preaching is deceitful and deadly. It's deceitful because when Jesus called us as Christians. He said things like, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 33. Jesus said, anyone who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. That's why it's deceitful, because it's not true. Prosperity preaching Prosperity gospel is a lie, my friends. It's deadly because the desire to be rich plunges people into ruin and destruction. Let's take a look at 1 Timothy 6, 9. One of our first verses that we're going to look up. 1 Timothy. You'll find that before Hebrews. 1 Timothy 6, 9. says this, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Now, it doesn't matter if you are a businessman who isn't a preacher. Uh, this, this particular scripture applies to you, 1 Timothy 6, 9. Thank you, Pam. It doesn't matter if you're a preacher and you want to be rich. Either way, this particular verse applies to you. So I have a plea to preachers of the gospel to preach the word of God in its entirety and not take it out of context and make it about prosperity, my friends. God doesn't love you more if you're wealthy. God doesn't bless you to be wealthy because he loves you more. 
You see, man can only receive what is given to him from heaven, John the Baptist said. And if God has given you little, be content with little. If God has given you more, be content with more. I always say, do you have money or does money have you? Because you can, you can have a little bit of money and fall into this prosperity preaching concept and idea and think that you are favored because you have more than other people. My friends, that leads to pride and arrogance. Number one, don't develop a philosophy of ministry that makes it hard for people to get into heaven. And we've done that through prosperity preaching. But I want to help you to understand what the philosophy of ministry is. Every Christian has a philosophy of ministry. Every preacher has a philosophy of ministry. My philosophy of ministry is different than my predecessor. My predecessor's name was Phil. He did wonderful work here at Park Place Church. His philosophy of ministry is different than mine. His wasn't bad or good. Mine isn't bad or good. It's just different. What is philosophy of ministry? Philosophy of ministry is biblical understanding for the purpose of the church. Okay? It's how we choose to interpret God's word to fulfill the purpose of the local church. My predecessor used primarily small groups. I don't as much. I do ministry teams. We have a different philosophy of ministry. One isn't right and one isn't wrong. They're both right. Used in a proper context, they can both be helpful. But there's philosophies of ministry within local churches that are heretical. They are heresies. So don't develop a philosophy of ministry that makes it hard for people to get to heaven. Jesus said, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Sorry, I think I'm going to sneeze. Excuse me. Maybe we can edit that out. Probably not. His disciples were astonished, as many in the prosperity movement should be. So Jesus went on to raise their astonishment even higher by saying, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. My friends, prosperity gospel isn't new. They believed it in Jesus' time. They believed that if you were wealthy, you had God's favor. People believe today that if you are wealthy, you must have God's favor in the church. That is not true, my friends. That is not true. Let's take a look at Mark 10, 23. Flip back over to the left. Mark 10, 23. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark 10, 23. This is so good. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? 24. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. What Jesus was saying is, it is impossible to be saved. He is not advocating that we need to be rich in order to get into the kingdom of God. But if we are not careful, we help people, we lead them into lies by wanting to help them because we believe the lies ourselves and therefore are deceived that prosperity gospel is true. My question for prosperity preachers is, why would you want to develop a ministry focus that makes it hard for people to enter the kingdom of God? Am I called to the wealthy? Let me tell you who I'm called to. I'm called to people that have ears to hear because the Holy Spirit has given them ears to hear the gospel. And so they are receiving the word of God with thanksgiving and with repentance and with brokenness. I want Park Place Church to be the church 
that receives people nobody wants so that we can be the church that everybody wants. Number two, do not develop a philosophy of ministry that kindles self-defeating attitudes in people. You see, prosperity preaching is also shame-based preaching, isn't it? Because if you're poor, even if you're middle class, even if you're low working class, you know, we have all these socioeconomic levels. Sociologists all, you know, they, 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 they write on this. Economists write on this. And I understand all these different levels, my friend, of poverty and, and working poor and, 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 and working middle class and middle class and, and um, you know, middle upper class and then upper class and then wealthy. And we have all of these classifications. But Paul said, there is great gain in godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we should be content. My friends, let me ask you, are you content? But then he warned against the desire to be rich. And by implication, he warned against preachers who stir up the desire to be rich instead of helping people get rid of their wealth. They asked people to hoard their wealth. He warned, that is the Apostle Paul, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction for the love of money is the root to all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pangs. Now, it doesn't say that money is the root to all evil. But the love of money is the root to all evil. So I ask you again, do you have money or does money have you? Because there's a lot of poor people that love prosperity preaching. And they are trying to get God's favor to be wealthy. They know they're poor. They know they're low income. But they are hoping and praying that God would bless their business or bless their family in such a way that they might receive a blessing from God. And when that blessing comes, God has put his favor on them. And by blessing, I'm talking about financial blessing. Let's make a distinction between a spiritual blessing and a financial blessing. Okay? Uh, yes, the love of money is the root to all kinds of evil, not money itself. For money is a good thing. It's a currency. Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar, but give to God what is God's. Jesus had a treasure, treasury, right? And who kept the money but Judas? And he helped himself to what was put into it. And Jesus didn't particularly say anything to him, apparently, as far as we're concerned, because Jesus wasn't concerned about money. So neither should we be concerned about money. I like what John Wesley said. Um, regarding money, John Wesley said, make all you can, give all you can, and save all you can. I think that's what he said. And I like that. All right, number three. Do not develop a philosophy of ministry that encourages vulnerability to moth and rust. I like that. Jesus warns against the effort to lay up treasures on earth. He warns us. If he's warning us about laying up treasures on earth, who are we to believe in prosperity preaching? That is, he tells us to be givers, not keepers, not to hoard wealth. Let's look at Matthew 6:19. Flip over to the left a little bit. Matthew 6, 19. If I have a scribe, can you write that? We're going to begin at Matthew 6, 19. I don't know if I... Yeah, there it is. Matthew 6, 19. I almost started in the wrong chapter. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. 
but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, my friends. Yes, we all keep something. But given the built-in tendency toward greed in all of us, why would we take the focus off Jesus and turn it upside down? You see, I think when Jesus comes back and he finds us wealthy, hoarding up our wealth, storing it to He's going to look at us and he's going to say, your treasure is here on earth. What, what, what can I offer you that you don't already have, my friends? What can I possibly give you in heaven that you haven't already received? No one on their deathbed said, I wish I had spent more time at the office. But that I wish I had spent more time with my family working for the kingdom, taking my kids to church, teaching Bible. Esther says, you never see a Brinks truck in a funeral procession. You're so right, Esther, because you can't take your money with you. So Jesus goes on to say, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves cannot break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. I'm going to have to make this a part one and two. We're going to finish this tomorrow. But there's just some closing statements that I want to share with you guys today. Are you focused on things of this world? If Jesus says, store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, he's not saying, he's not saying, give 100% to the church. Give to Pastor John and Park Place Church. He's not saying that. No, 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 no. Store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where thieves cannot break in and steal and where moth and rust cannot destroy. For where your treasure is, your heart is also. He is saying give to people who have need. Yes, you should give a tenth of your tithe. A tenth is your tithe to the local church. But he is saying love God with your gifts of service. Love his people. We've talked about the Shema. See, Esther, I'm learning from you. The great Shema. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and your neighbor as yourself, my friends. That's what it means. It's beautiful. To love our friends, our relatives, our associates, our neighbors. And give to everyone as they have need. My friends, are you trying to accumulate wealth? Are you focused on what you can gain in this world and therefore forfeit what God has planned for you? When Jesus comes in all his glory, he wants to show you what it means to have true riches. And it'll have nothing to do with what you can experience in this world. Bill Gates cannot experience this, my friends. I know you're some you're some you're some fans out there of Donald Trump. I'll just be I'll just be real honest with you. I am too. I voted for him. I'm not afraid to tell you. Okay? And he's a billionaire, I understand. But nobody can fathom. No ear has heard, no eye has seen what God has planned and prepared for those who love him. When we receive the kingdom of God, and get to see it in all its fullness and all of its glory, you'll wonder why you weren't more giving when you see all that Jesus prepared for you, my friends. Make all you can, save all you can, and give all you can, John Wesley said. And I believe that to be true. Don't hoard your wealth, give it away, save some, for a rainy day. Sure, God wants us to be responsible. God doesn't want you to be like St. Francis of Assisi who give away everything he had, left town naked, not even with a shirt on his back. So the story goes. I don't know if it's true, but I believe it is. I'm not saying you need to give away your home. I'm not saying you should give away your car. I'm saying you need to live 
in a way that is frugal, with generosity. Some of us have nicer homes than others. But my friends, give as much as you can and give until it hurts. Pastor, do you believe that Trump was cheated out of the election? Well, I don't get into politics, so I don't know. So I'm not going to speculate. But I don't mind telling you that I voted for him. And I think he's done some great things for this country. And I think we need to pray for our next president. Whether it's President Trump again or whether it's President Biden. Be ready and be in prayer, my friends. One thing I do know is Jesus is coming back soon because I can see the signs of the times. And I'm ready. And I'm ready. So my friends, I've got part two with you tomorrow. We are talking about prosperity gospel and the perils of prosperity preaching. Receive now this blessing. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would help us to loosen our grip over those things that we are holding on to that are important to us. And Father, help us to find people during this Thanksgiving season who are in need. Let us give to everyone as we can, Lord. For Jesus, your Father gave everything, his own very Son, to us. Who are we to hold on to anything? Father, I pray that you would help us to have a mind that is w wanting more than anything to serve God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves, and to be kind and gentle and giving with others. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I love you guys. Thank you, Marinella, for watching. Good to see you, Mary. And again, I love you guys. Have a wonderful day. Make all you can. Save all you can. But give all you can for the kingdom and for his glory. Be generous, guys and God will repay you tenfold. I believe that. It doesn't always happen in finances. He will repay you tenfold. And I want that blessing in a spiritual blessing. I want his spirit in me, around me, blessing me, encouraging me. That's what I want and that's what I need. So don't think of blessings as just financial blessings. Don't listen to those prosperity preaching uh, preachers. They're wrong about that. God can bless you in any number of ways, okay? And put yourself in a position to receive that blessing. And be blessed, my friends. I'll see you for part two tomorrow morning. Love you guys. Thank you, Marinella. Bye-bye.